Good morning. morning. My microphone on, there it is. Couldn't hear me the first time. So good, good morning. I want to welcome all of you online. I want to say hello to the Espinosa family today. Uh, May God's blessing be with you and also uh, the Hartle family. And uh, it's it's such a neat thing to have uh, the streaming that goes on to carry the, the service around to people that are in different parts of the country and they can participate with us and uh, be our brethren from far and uh, share texts and emails and all kinds of things with them uh, just as much as maybe we do when we're together. And it's, uh, it's amazing uh, technology and what it does. If uh, you're just joining us today for the first time or you're a visitor here, I want to welcome you to Rock Valley Christian Church. Uh, we are actually going to pick up today on a sermon that we started last week in regard to the Spirit of Truth and the Holy Spirit. And if you would turn with me uh, in the Bible to John chapter 14. And if you need a Bible, there's Bibles uh, in chairs uh, in front of you. If you look underneath, there's little baskets with Bibles. And uh, in John chapter 14, though, I would like us to notice uh, these verses. John chapter 14. It says uh, here in verse 16, Jesus speaking here says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Now, it's interesting that he's talking about another helper, because he he was there as their helper, as the Lord, Emmanuel, in the flesh. But he's saying now, I'm going to pray that you receive another helper. And that word another is not like a different kind. It's actually another, but of the same kind. And when he's saying, I want to pray the Father that you would receive another helper, notice that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now, last week we talked about how powerful that is and how humbling that should be to us to realize that the only way we receive the Spirit of God is because God blesses us with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes by Jesus Christ. John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me who will baptize with the Spirit and with fire, that this is the work of God in our lives, and it is something that we are dependent on him for, and we receive because of him. This is the work of God's grace. And we talked about the calling that no man can come unless the Father who sent me draws him, dragging us to the Lord. And the power of God and the power of his spirit to be in our lives is something that he does as a work, and we should all be continually humbled and thankful and appreciative that God has blessed us with his word and with his spirit, that we understand this, because he says the world cannot receive because it sees and neither sees him nor knows him. You realize this is a revelation, The revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's a revelation that comes to us. And so rather than feeling any arrogance or pride, we should be so humbled because of God's grace. Because apart from his grace, we are all part of the world. For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we all run each in his own way. But it was God through Christ that brought us back. And in this, he says, and now I'm going to pray that you receive the spirit of truth. But verse 17 says, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. Now, this is such a powerful thing. And as we come to this, this Pentecost weekend, as we celebrate, today is the seventh Sabbath since we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Seven Sabbaths to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days you should count. And we celebrate on this weekend, this time, when we look back and see the power of the Holy Spirit coming, where Jesus said, do not go out, but wait till you receive power from on high. And the power was the Holy Spirit, but also the spirit of adoption. As it says in Romans 8, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And Jesus saying, I'm not going to leave you orphans. And friends, again, how powerful is the Holy Spirit in our lives if we don't recognize the magnificence of what God is doing to say, I'm going to make you mine. I'm going to pour my spirit into you. I'm going to possess you. You will be baptized into my name and you will receive my spirit by which you will call out Abba Father, the spirit of adoption. 
And if ever there is anything in life that you should wholeheartedly pursue, it is the understanding and the relationship that we have with God. He did not leave us here to be alone and be orphans. He called us to be his kids. To be on this earth, living with him, abiding with him. He says you see him and you know him. And if you today are saying, well, I'm not sure then let this be inspiration because there is nothing else in life that brings us to the places that we would want to come, that where we need to be, or anything other than this work of God's Spirit in our lives. That was the promise that was offered on the day of Pentecost. Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, it says in Romans 8, we're not his. But the spirit of truth. And do we appreciate the leading, the guiding, the teaching, the prophecy, the testimony of Christ that comes by the Holy Spirit? That it says even in Romans 8, if, if, if we don't know how to pray, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the spirit makes intercession for us, searching out the will of God. And the reality of this fellowship, the reality of the relationship and the communion with the Holy Spirit is something that should be guiding our lives. And if we say, I'm not sure, I don't know, then let that be the inspiration to say, but I'm going to pursue till I know. To remove the doubt, to remove the unbelief. Because ultimately, it is the promise that we are to receive. The promise that comes from the belief in the gospel. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Notice here in Acts chapter 13. In verse 1. In Acts chapter 13 verse 1 it says, Now in the church that was at Antioch there were certain prophets and teachers... And see, that's something that I'd like to say here, right? At the church in Marietta, at Rock Valley, there's certain prophets and teachers, right? We should be saying this of all the churches of God everywhere. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, or excuse me, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. I just want us to think about that and meditate on that for a minute. Here they are gathered together, ministering to the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit speaks and says, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So they continued in the fasting. They continued in the prayer. They sent out in obedience to the Holy Spirit. Now, when you think about these verses that we just read in John about, I will not leave you orphans. The Holy Spirit will come and abide in you. You will know the Holy Spirit. There's a reality to the communion that comes from that relationship. When we are submissive to God Almighty, he blesses us with the Holy Spirit. And it says the Holy Spirit will not speak of his own authority, but as he hears from the Father, so he will speak. The, the reality of God in our lives is that we need the Holy Spirit, but also Think about what's happening here. Think about what happened with Saul, Paul, who was set apart here again for a work in a ministry. And what they were going to do is Saul and Barnabas went out on their campaign preaching the gospel. That it was by the direction of the Holy Spirit. This wasn't just the desire of Saul or Paul. It wasn't just the desire of Barnabas. It wasn't just something they developed a marketing plan or a campaign. They were being led by God. 
And the reality is that this power to say, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to direct you is something that should be central to who we are as Christians. Because it is what makes us Christians that Jesus Christ is our Lord and we set about to do his will as we are so led by the Holy Spirit. So the power that we are talking about is the power of a new life, not being left alone, not wondering, well, what should I do? But saying, lead me, guide me, direct me. And in our hearts, that's where it is. And notice that this direction came because they were fasting and they were praying. Now, I could have happened outside of fasting and praying, but they were beseeching the Lord. They were ministering to him. They were coming before him, and he spoke. Do we quiet our hearts and minds to seek the voice of God or not? Because if we have it all worked out, if all our theories and our logic is what guides us in our relationship with God and not the Spirit, we could be on right tracks or maybe not. But what is so powerful about this is the Spirit said, separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. And they fasted, and then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit. My desire is that for everyone that I can encourage and help in life, that you would be sent out by the Holy Spirit that you would know where you're going and why you're going because of the direction of the Holy Spirit. The calling changes everything. I've seen in myself desires to do works. When I was a young man, I knew the gospel needed to be preached. I knew I needed to share the word. And so my wife always faithful in helping me. I would write articles and put out newsletters and do all this stuff, and nothing came of it. It was what I wanted to do is what I believed I should do. I had studied the Word and knew what should be done, but what was happening in reality was I was doing work, but it wasn't directed from God. It was good work. I was delivering the gospel, but it wasn't being backed by the power of the Holy Spirit in and it wasn't being directed by God. And ultimately in my life, what I felt was the more I ministered the, or tried to teach, the more empty I was feeling. Because I was going out of my own will and my own direction, and I was not being effective. And, and, and what was the term, determination of that? Was I sensing the leading of the Holy Spirit? Or, or had I just said, well, I'm, I'm doing what it says? And it's not that we shouldn't look at the Word of God and do what it says, because as we talked about last week, the Spirit of truth illuminates the Bible to know what it says. Husbands, you don't need to wait for an unction to know to love your wife. Right? You don't need to, to wait for an unction to know that you should be out providing for your family. You don't need to wait for something to say, I need the inspiration, because it's already been revealed. It's already written out in the will of the Lord. You are ready to give an answer, right? You're ready to do the will of God. You're ready to do the works of God. You're ready to walk in obedience to God. But also there is this calling that in cases like this in Acts chapter 13, where God is saying, I'm going to do something. And it wasn't until I had gone through years of searching for the Lord, years of saying, I don't want my prayers to hit the ceiling and bounce back. I want to go to you, God. And to know a hunger and a desire for God and that he worked in me. It was his grace that made me come. He was dragging me against my flesh to say, get up in the morning and pray. And I'd be, I can remember times I was... 5 a.m. in the morning, I'm going to my, my living room at our house and just like, I'm here because of you. I don't want to be here at all. I'm tired, but this is the time I've got. And looking to the Lord and watching 
what he did. I know what it is to be dragged. I know what it is to be brought to a place that you say, I, I don't do this of my own self. That's why I said to me, the calling in the Lord is so humbling to me. I'm so thankful I cannot live without God in my life. There is nothing about me that is good and holy. It is only in him that I am made holy, that I am made separate, that I am set apart. It is only by him. If there is any good that you see, any light from me, it is from him. If there is any darkness that you see, it's me. For I know that in him, I live and move and have my being. He is everything. And when the Lord finally showed me, when he finally baptized me in the Holy Spirit, everything changed. I was different. I understood differently. All that I had studied became reordered in my heart and in my mind. And what came out was love and mercy and justice that wasn't there before. And the reality of God's grace to know the difference between knowing the word and knowing the word, Jesus Christ. To know the difference of studying the scriptures and knowing the one who wrote the scriptures. And the reality is that I didn't understand what it was to try to minister until I first had come to God through fasting and through prayer and through seeking. And for me, it was years. It, takes, it took me longer than maybe some because I was hard-headed. But I will always treasure, I will always treasure the courting of the Lord to say, you're mine. And once he finally came upon me, everything changed. Everything changed. I was baptized in the spirit. I was in my 20s. I was living in Illinois at the time. And the baptism in the spirit made me just want to minister to God in, in ways where it's like TV's not interesting to me. There's nothing that can compete with just worshiping God. And so I was traveling a lot then. I was traveling almost every week. And I would work all day. I'd get to my hotel room, and it was, I could have three or four hours to worship and pray. And it was awesome. I will always treasure those days. Treasure listening. Treasure praying, praising. But before I came to California here, it was known to us that we would be coming. And Stephanie and I had put on uh, our house on the market in Illinois. And uh, you, know, you never know what's going to happen. We put, it, we put it on the market, I think it was like maybe a Thursday or Friday, right before the weekend. And uh, that Sunday, I had to drive to Detroit. And so on the drive to Detroit, got four or five hours, crank up the praise music, pray, turn the praise music down, just pray. And as I'm praying to the Lord, I hear something very specific. And it was specific not in the sense of where the Spirit had led me before, but something specific to what I didn't know. And in my head I heard, you will receive an offer on your house tomorrow, and you will receive it at 8.31 p.m. Now that was interesting to me because... While I could sense the Lord leading me, teaching me, and guiding me, that was very specific. We just put our house on the market, and I'm told that, so, what did I do? I told my wife. I got to Detroit. I called and said, so, I was praying, and uh, I believe the Lord told me that we're going to get an offer on our house tomorrow at 831. Okay, it seems a little late in the day for an offer to be coming in. You know, there's logic. It's like, I don't know. But I wasn't, I, I wasn't for sure because I was still learning this in my life. So, working the next day, call home. Stephanie said, Kathy, our agent, called. She said, we're getting an offer today. I said, I know, at 831. 
she says, well, she's going to plan to be over around 8 o'clock, but she said she would be here between 8 and 8.30. And if she arrives between 8 and 8.30, we're not waiting, you know, till 8.31. And I said, I, I just feel really confident now. We're going to get it at 8.31. <laughs> so Kathy uh, makes her way over to the house, and she comes in and, and tells Stephanie, this, <laughs> this day has just been crazy. I've been behind all day. She said, I picked up the offer. I haven't even looked at it. I haven't even opened it to see what it is. She gives it to Stephanie. Stephanie is at the table. She starts opening the envelope. She gets ready to pull it out. She looks at the clock, and it says 831. That was cool for me. But it wasn't about that. It wasn't about the precision, it wasn't about hearing, because that was just a precursor to what happened the next day, which was rejoicing, praising, coming to God, right in the middle of worship, just stopped. And the Lord began to tell me who I was, the way he looked at me. He told me I would be moving to California. He told me what I was going to do when I would come here. And he told me about the things that he was going to do in my life. I'm not sharing those with you. Those are private. <laughs> but I have them written down in a journal. I wrote it down. Because I wanted to remember it. Because it was so specific and so direct. And it was so personal and it was so intimate. And this is just a part of it. But this was all foretold to me by the Holy Spirit. And the reality is that that gave me such comfort and consolation. But it happened, and I believed because of the word that came, that I would receive an offer and receive it at 831. And the woman was busy, and she showed up a little late and got it right at the time. And I was able to testify to Stephanie that she could witness it with me. So now, thank you, God. I hear you. Thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate it. The next day, I get in the car, start driving to do some work. I have about an hour's drive, praying. Again, you're going to go to Buenos Aires, Argentina. You're going to meet a man named Pastor Hector, and you're going you're gonna to go there. I'm sending you to Argentina. Now, for those of you that don't know me, which is probably most about me, I was terrified to travel to international countries. I had no desire to go anywhere they couldn't speak the English language. No desire to go to a place where I could not effectively communicate what I need. And I was traveling all around the United States. At this time in my life, I'd been to every major city in the U.S. I was comfortable traveling. But I knew I didn't want to go where they couldn't understand me and I couldn't understand them. And my wife knew this about me because I had told her, I'm not traveling to any international countries. And she knows I'm still not real stoked about this trip to Italy right now because I'm like, what if they don't make the talk? You know, it's, English is important to me. So I rejected. I started rejecting the word. I, did, I was like, no, no, I can't be hearing right. And again... And again, and I pray, God, if this is really you, you've got to confirm it again. And again, I hear, you're going. So I make a plan to go. I call a person I don't know and tell them, I know you don't know me, I don't know you, but I believe I'm supposed to come there, that God has told me to come. And he says, come. He couldn't speak English. We had a hard time communicating. The only word we really understood together was hallelujah. I got that one. I knew what he was saying when he said that. But that was it. And so I called back and I said, okay, I'm coming. These are the dates. And he had a translator there. And, the, and again, she wasn't very good, but she said, we'll be there. Somebody will be there for you when you arrive. 
well, that didn't seem real clear, like I was just feeling uneasy, but I went. And I'll tell you, I felt sick to my stomach the whole time to go and all the flight down there. But as I kept praying about it, I kept feeling more and more comfortable with the idea. I get down there to Buenos Aires, and it's, it's crazy. It's so busy. It's so big. There are so many people. But sure enough, go through customs, there's somebody there with my name waiting for me. And they take me to the church, and I meet the pastor, and he's not quite sure why I'm there, and I'm not quite sure why I'm there. I just know I'm supposed to be there. And they get me checked into a hotel. I go back to the church. This church is the coolest church. If you ever know what, want to know what I, I would love for this church, it'd be like that church. But that church was right in the heart of a city. And they had worship services every day of the week from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. They ran continually. It ran in continual cycles. They always were available to teach the word, to pray, to minister. They served food there. You could go for Bible study. You could get counseling. It was a place just to go to worship. And people came in and out all day. And on the weekends, like on Friday nights, there would be thousands of people in the sanctuary. You'd go in the morning, like on uh, the Wednesday, maybe the worship at 9 a.m. was 10 people. But it would just grow throughout. And then on the weekends, like Saturdays, Sundays, it, was, it would be anywhere from several hundred to several thousand people. They took an old mall, and the big gap in the middle of the mall was where they had their services. <laughs> It, w- it was huge, and, and, and all the old shops around were places to go pray and Bible study and for meetings and church offices and Bible classrooms, and the whole ministry was based on serving people in every way, and they, had, they took where some of the restaurants were in the food court, and they made it their food court, and you could get just like these awesome grilled meats. It was like four or five bucks, you know, just it was so cheap, and people could just stay there and eat. And it was such a wonderful environment. But here was the problem. I couldn't understand what was going on because everything was in Spanish. And I'm there with the translators, and they're sitting listening, and I'm sitting listening. They can understand, and I can't. And the whole first day of going through services, and I think I sat through four or five different church services just listening, felt nothing. I go back to my hotel room, and I'm like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? I, I didn't understand it at all. I, I felt lost. I felt confused. I started crying, just saying, God, am I hearing you or not? Because if I'm here, why am I here? Why won't you tell me why I'm here? Why did you send me here? And now I just feel empty and lost. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So I just spent the night crying and praying. Go to bed, go to sleep. Next day I get up, feeling better. Okay, today's a new day. Let's see, what, what, why am I here? The trip was only seven days. I'm like, I, I burned one. So I go to church, sit down, service, maybe 10 or 12 people. Pastor comes out, do some worship. Pastor comes out, starts teaching. And the interpreter starts interpreting to me. I'm like, oh. This is good teaching. It was so hitting me in the heart. It's going through in Isaiah about the one who was afraid. And, and the Lord says, don't be afraid. I will walk with you. I will grab you by with my right hand. Do not fear, little worm. <laughs> I was the worm. I think maybe everybody was. I know I was the worm. Because it was like the word was coming right to me to say, David, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I've got this. And as the, after the sermon ended, they, they had a call up. And I, I said to the interpreter, I said, why did, I said, thank you so much for interpreting. I said, why did you do that? Because I, I said, you weren't doing that yesterday. He said, the Lord told me I need to interpret for you. I'm still Facebook friends with that dude. And he told me, and that started changing everything. Because now I could understand what the teaching was, and I could receive it. 
And I could understand the offerings for prayer and ministry and receive it. And the thing is, I was so hungry for all of it. Give me the word. Give me the prayer. Give me whatever I need. And what I realized in that church was there was such a hunger for it. And the, the reality is then we started making plans. Okay, this is great. Okay, I'm understanding. And the pastor's like, well, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I'll, whatever. And he said, well, okay, well, maybe we'll set up a visit for you to go to a hospital. You can go pray for people there. We'll go to the prisons. You can do that. There's going to be a service here that I think you should go to. It's at the very poorest area of Argentina, uh, Buenos Aires. Just the, it's the poorest area. And he said, we have a church there. Maybe you could go there. He started making all these plans for me. So people were like, plans. So we go to the hospital. Like, no, you can't come in. So he said, okay, well, let's go to the prison. We go to the prison. No, you can't come in. So now I'm like, back to, oh, man, am I here right? What, what's going on? I thought, I thought this was why I was here, that you're going to teach me about ministry, and, and you're, you're preparing me for something. And so I go back to the, the church, and it's about now noontime. We go to the food court, and they're like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. Let's just pray. So we're sitting at a table, and we start praying, and don't really know what we're going to do, but I know that we just need to worship God. That's why I'm there anyway. No matter what the day holds, the day is to worship God. So whether you're working or playing or whatever, worship God. So we're there praying. So praying for maybe 45 minutes, the pastor walks by and he said, I just love the spirit I'm feeling coming from this table right now. He said, this, 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 this is wonderful. He, he had something to do and he just kind of walked on. And a girl who was there working in the kitchen came over and said, would you pray for me? I said, sure, what, what would you like me to pray about? And she said, well, I started working here. She said, I'm coming from Catholicism, I, but I believe that I need to be prayed for because something's happening in my life and I didn't come to work here because of the church but I'm feeling like I need to. So he said, okay, well there's a prayer room downstairs. Let's go to the prayer room. So we go to the prayer room and pray for her and as we pray for her, the spirit just comes on her and she, her face turns red and she just starts sobbing with a love for Jesus Christ. It was just amazing. And, and she just starts receiving of the Spirit and receiving of Christ and just realizing something's changing in her. And a person saw it happening. And when we finished with her, they came in and said, would, would you pray for her? Would you pray for me? And I said, sure. And prayed for that person. And another person saw and said, would you pray for me? And I said, yeah. Prayed for that person and another, and another, for eight hours. I stood there praying for people that came. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to do anything, except the most fundamental thing. Minister to the Lord, and he brought the opportunities to me. I didn't have to go out. Well, I wasn't too smart. I didn't learn my lesson because the next day we had another plan in the morning. <laughs> and that didn't work either. And I ended right back at the church <laughs> saying, well, it was a fun drive around Buenos Aires, but for what? Nothing. So, well, why don't we just pray? Well, it turns out my interpreter just was told that morning that his landlady said, I'm throwing you out. And he was in trouble. And he was very uh, distraught about what was going on. And he said, it feels more like it's spiritual than anything real. I'm paying my rent on time. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. But it just feels like she's coming at me. So we start praying. As we're praying... All the consternation, all the fear, like, where am I going? What am I going to do? It totally turned to joy. We started laughing about the problem. This is, this is great. 
So what's God going to do? What's God wanting to do in this? We don't fear because he's our provider anyway. He's the one that provides for home. He's the one that does everything. And we have a wonderful time of prayer. Somebody sees us praying, says, would you pray for me that I could be filled with joy for my trials? So we say, yeah, let's go to the prayer room. Go to the prayer room, start praying. Twelve hours later, after people had come in, we're dancing and praising the Lord. Because the Spirit was so It was like, how do you do this? We didn't eat. We didn't stop. It's just 12 hours and say, this is all for you, God. And to feel more alive and energized at the end of it than at the beginning was an amazing experience. Now, I'm telling you this to boast in Jesus Christ and what he can do to take somebody who's fearful and a worm and no one and say, I want to take you to a place and I can show you that you don't have to work out your ministry. You don't have to figure out what you're going to do. You don't have to be spending the energy and effort to develop your plan. I will give you the plan. And what was awesome about the plan was you knew that was what you were supposed to do. You were supposed to be there. You were supposed to go. While I was there, I I had the opportunity. There was a group of blind people that were meeting there and said, would you come and pray for us? Minister to us and and come in and pray. And I went in and started praying and, and prophesying. And a woman walked in the room. And as soon as she walked in the room, she was not blind. It was as if Somebody grabbed my head and just turned me to this woman. And look, as soon as I looked at her, I knew exactly what was in her heart. She was suffering from all kinds of, of fear and, and self-loathing and just an insecurity. She had no idea who she was. She was the daughter of the Almighty God. She was a princess who thought she was not worthy of anything. And so all this low self-image and all of this thing, she didn't see her identity in God at all. But yet she was coming, and she was there because she served the blind in the church. And God knew this woman. And what was amazing was, though I never met her, I knew. And I was filled with an anger for that spirit that was oppressing her. And it was such a strange thing because I was looking at her, knowing what the issue was, and feeling anger about it. Because she needed to be freed. And the reality of praying, I went around and she came. And as soon as she came before me, she started to try to talk to me. And I said, you don't need to say anything. Just just let me pray for you right now. And And as soon as I said that, tears just started streaming down her face. I mean, just, she was just crying and sobbing. And... I prophesied, I told her exactly what was going in her heart. I told her exactly where the falsehood was. I told her exactly what the truth was of Jesus Christ and who she was. And she just fell down crying. And and as she was sitting on the floor, the other people that were there were ministering to her and just praying for her. And And I kept going down the row of praying for different people. But when she had stopped crying, she said, I wasn't coming here tonight. She said, I was at home and and I was telling God what a failure I was and how nothing I was and I couldn't do anything and I feel so stupid and all these feelings of her inferiority. And she said, and I was crying out to God in prayer and she said, God said, go to the church now. I have sent a man there, and he will pray for you, and you will be delivered. And when she told me that, I realized how, how tiny I am. I'm just a little pong on a chessboard, and God can make things happen for people anywhere he wants. And the key is not to be trying to figure out what we're going to do with our lives. The key is submitting our lives to the leading of God 
for him to tell us what to do and when to do it. And friends, this is the leading of the spirit of truth. This is not being an orphan and not knowing what to do and where to go. That whole trip was, was just, it was fantastic. I saw people healed. I ended up getting to go and pray for the children in the children's hospitals. I saw kids who, said, who couldn't stop crying for three days stop crying when I prayed for them. And, and parents were sobbing and saying, how did you do that? Jesus Christ did it. I didn't do it. And praying for people and realizing this is just to be a vessel for Christ. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with what God determined to do. And as exciting and as fun as that week was, I think three of the days I, I fasted, I, and I, it was kind of funny because I realized, oh, man, I, I, I fasted for the last day. I didn't eat. I wasn't hungry because I was being filled up. And watching the experience was wonderful. And I come back, and there was carryover to what I was doing, and I went to a church service, and somebody said, you're now going to be entering a time of wilderness. <laughs> and everything that was told me uh, before that man, he prophesied over me the very things that God had spoken to me in secret, but that I would be going in a wilderness time and coming to California. Now, the reality is that of all of this, the thing that I'm conveying to you is that when you are seeking the Lord, you should have expectation of his guidance and leading and calling. For me, it took years of seeking to get to the point where that happened in my life. And it's taken years of continuing to walk to understand it is God who does the work. It is God who wills. It is God who does to his pleasure. And it is God that can bring you in. No one is more connected than the Almighty. He knows every person on this planet. You don't need to figure out how to reach them. You need to talk to the God who knows them. And the reality of ministry in life is coming to a place where you say, I don't know what I'm to do, but I know I'm to praise you. And be willing, be available to God. Now, the ministry of the church is a ministry that is not just for David or Scott or Stephanie or somebody who's in a position of ministry doing a Bible study, Chauncey or Bronte's up here singing or Izzy. It's not about the people, what they're doing. It's about you and what God will do through you the way he wants. The church culturally has been the priesthood, right, in the, in the Catholic priesthood, or the ministry and laity. There is authority within the church, but the way the authority has gotten perverted is to think that a certain people have gifts and other people don't. I'm here to tell you that the Bible actually says that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to every member. So, seek spiritual gifts. Three times in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, three times it tells you to seek. Three times. And do it in love. Because that is the better way. How do you go into ministry? You go not by figuring out what you want to do, but by asking God what he wants you to do and asking for the leading in what you can do and where you can fit. Now, you can have many different callings. You can have many different roles. You can have a role in your workplace. You can have a role in your family. You can have a role in your neighborhood. You can have a role in this church. You can have a role in the public square, in the parks. You can have all these different roles, and you might do different things at different times. But the point is to engage with God in the intimacy of relationship and say, lead me. 
He might lead you to teach somebody. He might lead you to testify the gospel. He might lead you to clean a toilet. But ultimately, are you putting yourself as a person available to be submissive to the lordship of God and of Christ to say, where do you want me to go? Send me. See, what I love about these verses in Acts chapter 13 is it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. That is where we should all want to be. I only want the work you want me to do. And I don't want to step out ahead of you, nor do I want to trail behind. Where do you want me to be? Where when, why, send me. And this is the heart of a church that is alive for God, that is not just coming for a service or not just coming for the friendships, but is coming for submission unto God to, to say, I'm yours. I will serve you. I will worship you. I will praise you. I'm available to you. And we as brethren together should be encouraging one another to say, let's seek the Lord for what he wants. Let's get together and fast. Let's take the advantage of the times to gather to pray. Do we believe that this could be us? See, this church was set apart by God and we sanctified it to be a house of prayer. To be coming before God to say, what is your will? Guide us in the way. We don't know it without him. We need him to continually direct. We need him to continually show us what to do. I need him to show me what to do. I need him to show you what to do. I need us to work together. And as a shepherd in the flock, I'm saying we all must come under the shepherd Jesus Christ to have him lead us and guide us by his spirit that none of us would be left out, that we would all take our place because what member isn't important if God has gone through the effort to call you and choose you before the foundation of the world to bring you to know the gospel, to bring you to a place where you know him and the grace, then enter the grace to be the person God called you to be. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. I am what I am by the grace of God. And I labor more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace that is within me. His whole life was turned upside down for Jesus Christ. And friends, that is the spirit of life that was in Saul, who became Paul, who wrote so much of this word to appreciate the grace that we have been given by the power of God. Notice with me here in Acts chapter... Well, you know what? We don't have time for this. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to I don't want to abuse your time and and your graciousness toward me. And ultimately what we're going to do is pray. Because these things should not be theory to us. These things should be practice to us. If I can't get you to the prayer meeting at 9:45, I'm going to get you to the prayer meeting at noon. And I'm asking you not to guilt you or not to pressure you. I'm telling you these things are real. And God is real and God is alive. And I'm asking you to accept your calling, whatever that is, and to seek your calling to say, Lord, send me. He's looking for a heart. It says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. If nothing else, let's show God that our hearts are loyal to him. Let's show God that we worship him, that we serve him, that we praise him. Let's pray. If you want to kneel down, feel free. I'm going to.
or stand. Bow your head, lift up your eyes, whatever God would have you do. Father, we in this room are gathered here today because you have called us to know you. We believe in you and we trust in you. God, the world may say you, you don't even exist. Or if you exist, that you are not caring and feeling that you are unloving. The world is lost and they are in a veil of darkness. There is darkness that is over this world, God, and the darkness runs deeper. And it is more sinister because it is clouded with the beauty of this world. With the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life where the need that we all have for you is somehow being impacted by all those things that don't satisfy. God, we are living on a planet of people who are in desperate need of you. We desperately need you, God. We need your spirit. We need your direction. Forgive us our iniquity. Forgive us where we are backsliding where we are not passionate for you. Forgive us where our hearts get cluttered with the things of this world and the cares of this life. Forgive us for all the things that we take to heart and we get so easily offended. We get so put out by other people. We get so distracted from the truth. Forgive us for not loving one another, Father, as you have directed us to love one another. Forgive us for not seeking your calling your voice, your direction. Forgive us for making our own plans, doing our own things, developing what sounds good in our own hearts without having from you, God, the directions that we need. Reveal to us your word that we may see it and know it and live by it. And reveal to us the things that you would have us to be doing, that our lives would be dedicated to you, that we could honor you in the way that we live, that we would just bless you but God, above all these things, there is one thing that we desire, that we would dwell in your house forever. Father, this room that we are in was sanctified to be a place for your presence. And we desperately need you here. And we need you in each of us. For you have blessed us with your spirit. And you have called us your temple. And as you have blessed us with the Holy Spirit to be in each one, we pray that you would bless, bless us, God. Cleanse out every vessel. Cleanse us from our iniquity and our sin, from all our faithlessness, where we lack love, where we lack of you, God. And please put within us an earnest desire for you, we love you. We worship you. And God, if you call us and send us forth as you did Paul and Barnabas, then go with us and bless us with every spiritual gift and insight and wisdom that we could truly fulfill what you would have us to do. Grant us the gifts of your spirit that we may bring your gospel, your edification, your freedom to others. God, God, we, we need you. You are everything. There is nothing in life that matters apart from you. You are our portion. You are who we need. And in you there is satisfaction that does not end. Holy, Holy Father, please bless us with your spirit to intercede for us. We don't even know how to pray as we ought to pray. We submit to your correction. We submit to your word of truth. We submit that we need you. And oh, Loving dad, dad, we need you. We need the blessing that comes from you, your authority. 
we come to you in Jesus' name by his authority. For it's by his blood that he entered this holy place. It is by his blood that we've been ushered in. Thank you for making us holy and accepted in him. Thank you for causing us to abide in your son. Bless us, holy God, as we walk on this earth, that we may be vessels of honor, that we may bring the fragrance of Jesus wherever we go. Please direct us specifically on where to go and what to do. Do not be distant in voice. Do not be quiet with any of us. But as you have called each member, so direct us together. Unify your body. Unify a people that brings praise and honor to you. And Father, in our lives, let us always know that we do not need to angst over any of this. We do not need to stress about it. But rather, we just put all to you. That we will worship you and minister to you and serve you. Because you are the true and living God. Creator of all things. Savior of people. You are loving. You are kind. And you love to show yourself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal. You wrote in the word in Malachi that you listen when people fear you and they talk of you. You write a book of remembrance for them. You listen in. And God, how we love that you listen. Because you also promised that if you listened, you would answer. And we simply want you in our midst. May all the glory, the credit, the honor be to you. May the work be one that brings glory to you. And may your people be humble in all things. That we would not be boastful or proud in anything other than you are God. That Jesus is our Savior. And the Holy Spirit, the Helper, is our Comforter. May we grow in richness. May we grow in the riches of of heavenly gifts, and may we have a deeper revelation of who you are. We need you. In every way, we need you, and we love that we need you, and we rejoice that we need you, and we rejoice that this is dependent not on us, but on you. You are God. You are worthy of glory and honor and praise. We praise you, holy God. We praise your holy name. We bless you for you are good for all time, forever and ever. Let all that has breath praise the Lord. Let all that has breath give you glory. Let all of us give you glory and honor and praise. You alone are God who made us. You alone are God who saves us. You are the God of the universe. And it is our great pleasure to be called by you, to know you, to love you, and we ask, pour out your spirit of grace that your work would be done in our lives. Correct us, instruct us, lead us, guide us, and pour out your glory on us that we may give glory to you, the very glory that Jesus prayed that we would have. We accept God and ask you to bless us with it that we may bring honor and glory to you. In everything, bring us near to you. We desire to be intimate with you that you would speak to us face to face as friend speaks to friend, as you have to your servants. And we ask you to raise up apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, administrators, helpers, those who have gifts of healings and working of miracles, of gifts of words of wisdom and words of knowledge, that, God, you would grant a discernment of spirits, that we would know the difference between good and evil and right and wrong, that you would bless your church, that you would teach us and instruct us, God, that you would send forth gifts, that you would send forth people all around this world, that, God, you would just raise up an army of believers who are set 
on their hearts and minds to serve and worship you and to go wherever you would have us go in ministry. Father, we praise you and we thank you. We love you. We love you so much. And we say all this because we have authority in Jesus and we look forward to all the ways that you hear and answer our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.